Buck, joining us now from New York, the Pulitzer Prize winner and author of Salt, Sugar, Fat, Michael Moss, who has spent years investigating the science behind junk food. Junk food in a moment, although connected to the first question I want to ask you, which is horse meat. Does that surprise you that it got into the food chain? It reminded me of the reporting I did for the New York Times on deadly E. coli in hamburger. The result or the cause of which was a really scary thing in food, which is the largest food giants are losing control of their ingredients simply because the food chain globally has grown so complex and so addicted to profits that it's really difficult for these companies to keep track of what they're putting in their own products. Well, that word addicted, that word addiction, is very much at the center of your book because you, you really argue that uh, the big companies uh, do in fact know precisely what is happening to the human being as a result of what they produce and are thrilled about it. The food industry, if there's any word they hate more, it's the word addiction. They prefer euphemisms like craveability or allure. But whatever word you choose, the result is the same. Salt, sugar, and fat to them are the three pillars. They're the holy grail. And they know from their own research that when they hit the amounts perfectly, will go over the moon for their products. The, sh the products will fly off the shelves, will buy more, eat more, they'll make more profits. Now, These are the it, key to the, to the processed food industry, and it's, it's important to know that. Now, in, in your book, you're very specific about the big companies that are doing this to us. You name names. I'm just wondering, particularly the secret meeting you dis depict in Minneapolis, in which they were told in no uncertain terms what they were doing and refused in any way to change their ways. Anybody sued you yet? <laughs> we now know from that meeting, and I interviewed several participants who are very proud of having organized that meeting. We now know that as far back as 1999, CEOs, presidents of the top food companies in the country, in this country, knew that the obesity crisis was something that was being laid at their feet and they needed to take some responsibility for. The other extraordinary thing about that meeting, as you'll find throughout my book, is that these are top food company executives saying, hey, wait a minute, we've got to stop and do something here. This is our responsibility. And they're pleading with their companies to start turning the corner on obesity and diabetes and high blood pressure and all of the other public health ills that have beset the world, thanks in large part to processed foods. Well, the chain that you dis depict, the chain of responsibility for fattening America, for fattening the westernized world and increasingly the developing world deliberately, I mean, it's, it, it's as strong as that, uh, you would think that somebody very obese, for example, might try to bring a case against them. Is anything like that happening? Companies argue really convincingly that they have not been trying to make the world fat or otherwise ill because it's not in their self-economic interest to do so. That said, again, they're doing what companies do, which is trying to make a profit, and they're driving to make their products every bit as alluring as possible. There's a distinction, though, with tobacco, and I think lawyers in this country have been reluctant to bring cases against the food industry because food is inherently different than tobacco. Food is supposed to make you healthy. It's supposed to make you fit. It's supposed to help our kids grow up and be strong. And that's sort of one of the most startling thing about walking into the grocery store, which it, it takes an effort by shoppers to get in and out of the grocery store with your good health intact. Michael Moss in New York, thank you very much indeed for joining us.